Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I hereby declare open the 16th meeting of the 47th session of the Human Rights Council. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we shall now begin the interactive dialogue with the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. The list of speakers will close in 15 minutes. It is my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Olivier de Chouter for his uh, presentation. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be invited to take the floor at this session of the Human Rights Council. I took, up, I took up my mandate on May 1st, 2020, as the world was entering the worst economic recession since the Great Depression of 1929. As a result of the pandemic and the measures adopted to protect populations, an estimated 115 million additional people may have fallen into extreme poverty in 2020, and 35 million more may follow this year. This was not inevitable. The reality is that we have been caught unprepared. 61% of the global workforce is still made up of informal workers or workers in precarious form of employment with little or no access to social protection. 55% of the world's population, 4 billion people, have no social protection whatsoever. And an additional 26% are covered only against certain forms of economic insecurity. When the crisis hit, many countries adopted social protection measures to cushion the populations from the shock. But these measures were mostly ad hoc and short term. Because social registries were often out of date or incomplete, many people were left out. And because many people in poverty could not file claims because of lack of information, lack of documentation, or lack of internet access, the social benefits often did not reach them. For low-income countries, an additional constraint is, of course, the lack of fiscal space to invest in social protection. These countries face the burden of high levels of debt, and initiatives such as the G20's Common Framework for Debt Treatments Beyond the Debt Service Suspension Initiative are not the answer, since these countries fear apparently not without reason, that if they seek de debt restructuration, they will be poorly noted by rating agencies. These countries have also been impacted by the loss of remittances, and until recently, by the fall of commodity prices uh, on which much of their export revenues depend. Moreover, these countries are typically weakly diversified. As a result, they may be hesitant to set up standing rights-based social protection schemes guaranteeing entitlements to the population since they know that in times of crisis their public revenues may fall at the same time that social needs and thus demand for social protection increases. The report I'm presenting today proposes that collectively we address this challenge. It builds on broad consultations that started a year ago involving governments, international agencies, unions, employers, organizations, and civil society. It argues that a global fund for social protection should be set up to increase the level of support to low-income countries, thus helping them both to establish and to maintain social protection floors in the form of legal entitlements and to improve the resilience of social protection systems against shocks. The report shows that this is affordable. The ILO estimates that the funding shortfall for low-income countries representing 711 million people is 79 billion US dollars per year, including 41 billion US dollars for healthcare. While this represents 15.9% of the GDP of low-income countries, an entirely unaffordable amount uh, for these countries, this is only half of the total level of official development assistance provided by OECD countries in 2020. The reality is that social protection until now has been largely neglected as part of official development assistance. In 2018, it represented 1 billion US dollars, 
which is 0.7% of total ODA, we can and must do better. Yet ODA should not be the only nor even the main source of funding for the Global Fund for Social Protection. Mobilizing the IMF's special drawing rights would be basically a costless way to finance this mechanism. Indeed, at their meeting of 4th and 5th of June, the G7 ministers of finance and central bankers referred to the need to use special drawing rights for an equivalent of 650 billion US dollars in support of countries' efforts to finance the economic recovery, with 21 billion US dollars going automatically to low-income countries, and of course, SDRs that are unused by other countries might complement that. This corresponds also to a proposal made in the report presented to you today. While international support is crucial, it should not be seen as a substitute for the mobilization of domestic resources to finance social protection flaws. Rather, it should be seen as an incentive to encourage recipient countries to build capacity and to invest more in this area. Social protection, indeed, should not be seen as a cost. It should be seen as an investment with potentially high returns, since it leads to building human capital, has significant multiplier effects on the local economy, and contributes to inclusive growth and to resilience in times of crisis. International support, therefore, should be seen as launching a process that will allow recipient countries to gradually increase the levels of domestic resource mobilization. Rather than creating a new form of dependency, it would ensure a predictable level of support to countries committed to establishing social protection floors whose ability to finance social protection would improve in time. The report proposes a roadmap for the establishment of the Global Fund for Social Protection, building on the already existing structures that have been developed on an ad hoc basis to provide support for the universalization of social protection floors. The challenge now is to strengthen these structures, not to weaken them, not to duplicate them, in order to ensure that these structures more work more effectively with one another and to scale up the level of support while ensuring that such support is also adaptive to future shocks. There is now a strong momentum behind these proposals. On June 19th, the International Labour Conference adopted conclusions requesting the ILO, I quote, to initiate and engage in discussions on concrete proposals for a new international financing mechanism, such as the Global Social Protection Fund, which could complement and support domestic resource mobilization efforts in order to achieve universal social protection. The conclusions adopted within the International Labour Conference are premised on the idea that, and I quote again from the text which was adopted, actions and measures to realize the human right to social security should ensure everyone has access to comprehensive, adequate and sustainable protection over the life cycle. I am grateful to the governments who supported this outcome and to the mobilization of unions, as well as of civil society through the Global Alliance for Social Protection Floors, which made this outcome possible. The Human Rights Council is now given an opportunity to support what I see as a major step towards the realization of the human right to social security, in line with Article 9 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, but also with ILO Social Protection Floors Recommendation Number 202, unanimously adopted in June 2012, as well as with targets 1.3 and 3.8 of the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2015 Addis Ababa Action Agenda included a pledge by the heads of government and high representatives to provide strong international support for the efforts to establish social protection floors. We must now deliver on those pledges. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, an addendum to my annual report summarizes the findings of my visit to the European Union. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to my interlocutors within the EU institutions and EU member states, including France, Italy, Portugal, Slovenia, and Spain, for their constructive engagement 
with the mandate. The main lesson from the visit is that while the EU has launched a number of programs, some of which are remarkable to combat poverty, the member states still encounter a number of obstacles to effectively address poverty and inequalities, including unhealthy social and fiscal competition between countries and socio-economic governance frameworks that do not favor social investment. The economic recovery provides a unique opportunity to rethink these constraints, and I look forward to my continued dialogue with the EU on these matters. In closing, I would like to thank the staff of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for its support. I'd like to thank Belgium, Finland, Germany and Luxembourg for their budgetary contributions to the mandate, without which it would be unable for us to make an impact. And I would like to thank governments of all world regions, which part of the informal Friends of the Mandate allow me to maintain close links with the different regional groups within the Human Rights Council. I would not have accepted this mandate if I believed poverty to be a fact of nature and its eradication to be a distant dream. I believe the opposite. I believe we can make it history. The establishment of a global fund for social protection is an important step towards this objective. Thank you, and I look forward to receiving your comments and questions.